Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. Today we've got a great story of compliance taking down some creepy new owners of a store. But first a story from Sriwer, Boiler Room Office Space. This happened in former Yugoslavia in the 80s. It was still a communist country, but by then they started allowing for some privately owned companies limited in size. My brother was working for one such company, which made high-end custom AC systems. And that's how I know about this story. As this was a novel concept at the time, office space was almost non-existent. You had this huge state owned by companies who had their own buildings with everything they needed, including office space. And outside of that, there was never a need and nothing was built with that in mind. So you really needed to think outside the box for this one. And that brings us neatly to the second peculiarity of life in former Yugoslavia, apartment buildings. To keep this short, at some point before, a whole bunch of them were made. Basically a whole new part of the city, and all of them had this huge space in the ground floor or first floor that was planned to be the boiler room, which was later abandoned in favor of one big heating plant to which all the buildings in that area were connected to. As you can see where this is going, owner of the fledgling company approached apartment building representatives and asked them to rent the space intended for non-existing heating systems. Now, these guys in this particular building were retired military officers, so a little bit arrogant and not big on asking questions. They had no idea what was going on other than some guy was willing to give them money to rent part of the building that was never used. Not much money, but basically free money for them. So they signed a standard renting contract, which is very important for later. Owner converted the boiler room to a two-floor office with all facilities, and that was that for a while. One point about this guy, he didn't like to rent. So after a while, when business started to pick up, he started building a new factory that included much needed office space. When this was finished and he was ready to move, he again approached the apartment building representatives with a proposal to pay him some of the costs of remodeling. They could now rent for a way higher price as the office space was by then in high demand. And for what he was asking, they would be clear in less than a year and after that profit. But as I said, former military officers, bit arrogant, used to get their way. They thought about it and said, no, you're moving out and we're going to get that anyways and for free. Owner said, okay, no problem. Gathered all of his employees and said, anything you need from the former office, feel free to take. Electric plugs, toilet bowls, doors, anything that could be dismantled could be taken. After that, he brought a small excavator, drove it in, and started tearing that place clean. By then, building representatives are running and screaming bloody murder, threatening to call the police. Militia then. Legal actions, everything and anything. Owner calmly takes out the standard renting contract with highlighted premises to be returned to original state after renting period. Now there's something poetic about a bunch of entitled arrogant jerks being screwed and knowing they can't do anything about it. My brother says it was glorious. I wish I was there to see it. Also I'm happy to say that the company managed to survive the Balkan wars of the 90s and is still going strong to this day. If you were in a situation like this where they wouldn't pay you for all the additions and improvements you made, would you be willing to go and tear down an entire office space just to get back at these people for refusing to pay you for any of it? Or is it really not worth the effort? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Our next story is from Lego John. Family operated video chain in Raleigh gets bought out by unsavory weirdos. They suck the chain dry and leave hundreds of loyal customers in the lurch. 1999 to 2000, I worked at a six or seven store video rental chain in RTP. Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill. I was figuring out where I was going to get my teaching degree at the time, and I love movies, and this was a perfect fit. Paid marginally, but I took a bunch of film classes at NCSU, and this was my second dream job. Huzzah! Owner was a former IBM or Cisco or some such other brainiac in RTP. They hired me, it was fun to work there, and I got paid to clean the carpets, put VHS and DVDs, really new at the time, on the shelves and generally be a happy fun dude. I rocked at the job. I really did. The chain was a good counter to Blockbuster. It offered the same movies but more of a personal touch. I loved it. Owner even created his own Mac checkout system. He created the entire purchase system. It was pretty impressive. 
Owners decided to shutter it all and focus on raising their kids. They sold the company to a dude from Georgia Military Something Academy. I don't know his official title, but he reminded me of George C. Scott in Taps. It was a military school, and he was the head honcho until he left to take over six to seven independent video stores in the greater Raleigh, North Carolina area. New owners move in, mood changes drastically. Not family happy feeling anymore, it's more of a move product bottom line. I used to love coming in early on Tuesdays because the real movie nerds would arrive early on new release dates and I'd hand them the brand new DVDs and generally be a movie dork. It was a really fun job. The small chain, whose name shall not be said, Fizzy Drink Videos, had a really great deal. Video rentals were $3.50, but you could buy a 10 block for $25, saves you a dollar each time. I upselled the heck out of them because it was a genuinely great deal and we had hundreds and hundreds of families who had this prepaid thing. About six months into the new owner's reign, they had set us up with a triple X video section. Previous owners had dirty movie sales for a few years, but stopped it. There was talk among the stores that the new owners had a nefarious background at the military school in Georgia. Internet was still fledgling, so we just had the rumors. Man, I ride too much. Let me get to the punch. One day, I arrive and get a call from the carry store, and the manager there said the store is closing. Close everything, shut down everything, owners are declaring bankruptcy, and everything is going to be liquidated. I'd built up a really good relationship with dozens of happy movie families over the last 18 months. And now I have to lock the doors, and the new owners have thousands upon thousands of dollars already paid on the $25 for 10 movie rentals deal. My happy customers are going to lose it all. The manager at the other branch told me to lock the doors and go home. My final paycheck would arrive sometime. I spent the next seven and a half hours sitting out by the drive through drop box. Every car that came up to dump off a movie, I told them to keep them. And when Mr. Will Fong, that awesome 70 something year old man who always came in every Tuesday to check on new movies came by, I told him that this store and the other stores are deader than disco and his prepaid movie rentals are gone. I brought him inside and Willy wonka at him. Take anything. In a week this will all be liquidated. Every single car that came up to dump off a VHS or DVD. I asked them if they'd prepaid the 10 for $25 deal. If they said yes, I told them to park and come inside. I told them to take whatever they wanted. The store had a liquidation sale shortly after. And a year after that, it was turned into a vet clinic. So that made me happy. I haven't been by there in almost 20 years. I regret absolutely nothing from that last day. And I would do it again in a heartbeat. I mean, obviously this place was shutting down and it was all just going to get shoved into some kind of liquidation sale. But could there have been some kind of legal ramifications if the owners were to investigate? Like, do you guys think that OP could have been smacked down by the law, been forced to pay a estimated sum in court for all the movies he more or less just let the people kind of steal? I know it didn't happen, but that's what I would have been curious about. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Every video has awesome stories, like our next story from Waldo06. Josh is on the grill until 11.55, so stop pestering him and do your station. Was reminded by another post about my time in fast food and how I maliciously complied. Anyways, back in college, I worked at an on-campus fast food place. Your basic burgers, fries, wraps, and small salads. My shift started at 11.25, doing wraps until 11.55 when Josh left. And then I manned the grill and someone else did wraps. Now Josh was a typical Josh, and it was his way or the highway. He'd get really mad when I'd throw more burgers on the grill or flip something while he was trying to chat up the dishwasher. I did this because he had no understanding of how much food was required to feed college kids during the small breaks between classes. Eventually he complained enough that I was told, Josh is on the grill until 11.55, so stop pestering him and do your station. So I did. I stopped touching the grill. The next shift, he leaves at 11.55, and I get on the grill and immediately throw down 40 frozen raw burger patties. Two minutes later, the cashier starts yelling, where are the burgers? 
Sorry, I just got on the grill, and Josh only had five in the warmer and three in the window. I know we always have about 100 students between 11.55 and 12.20, and they almost all get the burger meal, but I was told not to touch the grill. The burgers finish after a few minutes, and the next batch goes on, but the grill has cooled a little, so they take even longer. The line of kids waiting for food is longer than the line ordering, and management is pissed. I get chewed out for not being fast enough and just ask, do you want raw burgers or to talk to Josh? It took one more shift of this for them to realize that my meddling was actually what kept us afloat during the lunch rush. I'd often cook an entire grill of burgers while he was swinging and missing with the dishwasher. They eventually printed out a sheet of how many burgers slash chicken etc needed to be prepped for certain rush times and gave Josh a very stern talking to about how to be a team player. Also, Josh sucked because he'd cook all the burgers well done like really well done then they'd sit in the warmer for another 5 to 15 minutes he didn't know how to rotate either so you were eating god darn hockey pucks he ruined so much ground beef he eventually got moved to salads and stock because he couldn't be trusted with anything that was fast paced management saw how much faster everything moved when he wasn't joshing everything up Oh man, hearing about Josh was bad enough, and then at the very end, OP has to go and drop that bombshell that Josh was cooking all these burgers well done and then leaving them sitting for another 5 to 15 minutes. Honestly, I could imagine that would be hurting their sales even more than not having enough stock for the lunch rush. Imagine you go to the campus fast food place and you get this hockey puck husk dried carcass of a burger. You're probably not going to order there again, right? And our final story of the day is by YH Cran Anarchy. Sorry, I'm not PC manufacturer support. Please stop calling. To start off, this isn't my story, but a friend of a friend's. I'm telling it as I remember it, so I don't have specific details, but I'll provide as much as I can. About 15 years ago, a relatively large PC manufacturer, who I will not name for the sake of protecting identities, offered Windows OS support in addition to hardware support for their PCs. Well, in the state of Utah at the time, the predominant area code for phone numbers started 801. About two to three times a month, someone would somehow transpose the 1-800 portion of the support line and punch in 1-801 instead. This friend's phone number was identical to theirs, the difference being the toll-free area code versus the local area code. 99% of the time, he'd tell them, yeah, you need to dial the 800 number, you dialed 801. They'd understand, apologize, and hang up. Well, one older guy who hated himself, humanity, the neighbor's dog, Wednesdays, etc., called him and, rather than accepting his error, just pressed redial on his phone. Every time he called, he would become more agitated and escalated with insults, general debaggery, and demanding help with his operating system. Finally, after a few calls, the friend had had enough, recognized the number calling through, and answered, Hi, PC manufacturer support, how may I assist you? Yeah, first of all, some donkey kept hanging up on me and wouldn't fix my computer. I want him fired. Oh, certainly, I'll personally make sure he doesn't work for PC manufacturer as soon as this call is completed. What can I assist you with today? Old man screaming at clouds.mp3 Side note, it's worth mentioning, this friend of a friend was a PC hobbyist and knew his way around PCs quite well. He just didn't want to do customer service for the company for free. But in this moment, he just snapped. The troubleshooting steps I'm about to list below should never be performed by anyone. Okay, so I know what the issue is and there's a really easy way to solve this. First things first, I need you to navigate to my computer. Okay, now you should see something in there that says local disk and in parentheses a capitalized C. Please click on that. Once that loads up, you'll want to locate a folder labeled Windows and inside that folder, open another one labeled System32. Excellent. Now, this is a known issue that happens sometimes. Do you see anything labeled Kernel in there? You do? Okay. So if you have too many of those, it'll slow down your computer. Just select all of those and delete them. It may prompt you for an administrator password. That's just your normal password to log into your computer. Okay, those all gone? Perfect. Now please restart your PC. Click. 
He immediately turned off his cell phone and left it off for about six hours. When he turned it back on, he had about 15 minutes of voicemails to listen to, and I've been told they were quite humorous, a bit graphic, and a couple got racist. I'm sure most of you guys probably know, but if you don't, deleting System32 for a Windows PC or deleting the kernel inside System32, to describe it in a really basic way, it's kind of like the basic base level code for the operating system itself. So deleting System32 or kernel inside, that's like deleting the files that makes the Windows operating system work. So you delete those and turn off your computer, Windows is not going to work. You're going to have to reinstall Windows on your computer, which for somebody like that old man, I'm sure is a major headache. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another malicious compliance story that was even more insane than the ones in this video, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, click on the right. But with that said, I'll see you all next time for some more stories.